Welcome back to the Go Engineer YouTube channel. I'm Sam Onis. Today's video is from a recorded webinar about composites simulation. Before we get started, make sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Let's dive into the content. So, where does composites fall in in the SOLIDWORK simulation bundles? You see over here, all the way over on the right, Simulation Premium is the highest bundle that we offer in the, in the SOLIDWORKS portfolio of simulation. Really all that Composites does in, in the context of simulation is it's just a different element type. Okay, so it's not really necessarily a specific study, it just allows you to describe that unique material that is a composite inside a simulation. And those, those composite elements, they can be used in linear static problems, frequency studies, as well as buckling studies. So those are the three kind of study types you can use the composite element in. Let's start at the beginning here. So what is a composite? Generally described, it's two or more separate materials. Usually think about that as a solid fiber, something that's, that's strong, it's gonna provide a lot of rigidity surrounded by a binding matrix. So those images on the right side are just trying to illustrate how you can kind of visualize the matrix surrounding the fiber. The reason for that and the benefit of using this type of material is like the matrix gives the composite shape, allows the loads to transfer to those more structurally rigid fiber reinforcements, allows us to design in a lot of really great structural advantages. So they're really great materials with a lot of great properties in them. They have this macroscopic, excuse me, structural unit between those two materials that are kind of fused into one with uh, maybe any different kind of manufacturing process. So those, Im those images, those visuals on the right are just kind of, imagine a, a cross section through a, a composite material just to kind of give us an idea of how these materials are structured. Some common examples of those fiber materials, those strong rigid materials that really, really give composites their, their big benefits. A lot of times those fibers are glass, carbon, uh, PE, polyethylene. Ceramic quartz are also common in certain applications. And for the matrix material, it's usually something like a thermal set resin, polyester or vinyl ester, and the epoxies are popular as well. So just kind of some, some quick examples there, an idea of what is a composite? How does it come together? What does it look like? And then what are their advantages and disadvantages? So. Lightweight, lightweight is really, really the big thing, um, especially comparing to your traditional metals like steels and aluminum. They're really lightweight, and a lot of times they're even stiffer, stronger, durable, more thermal resistant, all of those things. So we can think about these composites of ha having really great specific stiffness and specific strength. And what that specific term means is just kind of taking that, that stiffness, maybe a yield strength, and just taking it into account per mass density, per unit mass density. So having a high specific stiffness, a high specific strength means that considering how, how lightweight composites are, they're still very strong. So that stiffness, uh, what does that really mean? It's just think of that as like a, a resistance to bending. Strength means how much stress is it gonna take to start cracking. Durability, that's, resistance to fatigue. So composites are also really great in fatigue applications. They're thermal resistant. They're really good insulators. They're not going to expand much when you heat them up. They're also weather resistant. So, you know, like steels and aluminums, we have to worry about rusting and, you know, maybe sometimes we paint them to avoid that. Uh, we don't have to worry that about that kind of thing with composites because they're, they're, they're weather resistant. And also really the biggest thing about composites or one of the biggest things is that we can optimize the properties. And what that means is we're working with orthotropic material properties. What that term orthotropic means is that uh, it's gonna have different stiffness in different coordinate directions. So we know because of the fibers are stiff, they're really strong in that fiber direction, the direction that the fibers are oriented, 
we're going to be a lot more stiff in that direction. We can build into our design what that fiber orientation is so we can really streamline the material. We almost get to design the material around our part to make it fit for the loads and the performance that we're looking for. So really, really great material when you really want to customize those properties for a very specific application. Now on the downside, definitely more expensive than your traditional metals. Development time, yeah, you know the benefit of having those optimized properties are great, but that also means more engineering time on the front end. Um, so just the development time on those generally longer than your typical metals. We also have some pretty specific manufacturing constraints, but not going to get too far into those details. Just wanting to kind of summarize and uh, show their advantages and disadvantages here on this slide. So moving into what's included inside of SolidWorks, go through a little bit and kind of summarize how we set up the geometry in SOLIDWORKS for these special composite elements and then how we define the mesh. So we'll go through how we do the design stuff, um, see how the fibers map to that geometry that we select. It uses what we call a shell element. So if you're not familiar with shell elements, that's all right. I'll introduce them briefly here on the next couple of slides. but. The shell mesh itself is uh, defined on a surface, okay? So it could be a surface body or a selection of faces on a solid body. And then that, that selection, that geometric selection, determines what direction the fibers are going to go. We do get control over the orientation based on a zero degree angle reference. So we can do like a minus 45, plus 45, or a 90, that kind of thing to kind of change it throughout the stack up. And in that stack up formulation, we also define the material and the thickness for each ply or each layer. All right, so looking a little bit more closely at how we define those shell elements, I mentioned here that they, they apply on surfaces. So that means for SOLIDWORKS geometry, we can either have a dis distinctly modeled surface body, like I'm showing here. We can see that there's no thickness to that body. We can think of that surface, often we describe that as the mid-plane of the shell mesh. So we're putting equal amount of material on either side of that shell, perhaps, depending on how our plies stack up. So that's if we have a distinctly designed surface body. We can also define the, the shell mesh if we don't have a surface body defined on a selection of faces. Maybe if we've modeled in a thickness, because that's that's how you're going to manufacture it. That's how you model it, right? So maybe you don't have that surface body. You can select faces on a solid body to define that that mid-plane surface where the shell mesh will be defined as well. And once we make that geometric selection, we go we can go on and define our our mesh. And in that mesh definition, we see how the fibers map to that selected geometry. We have two options for how that mapping works. We can do a surface mapping, which uses UV coordinate curves. If you're not familiar with that, it's just a nice way, kind of, you can kind of think of UV curves, like U is like X and V is like Y. It's just a different coordinate system for mapping these, these directional fibers onto the geometry that you select. So you see each one of these darker lines represents the fiber if we can visualize it that way and that u direction or that x direction is our zero degree reference and that's noted in a pre in the preview with the red arrow you see on the on that surface so the red arrow is our zero degree reference there's a green arrow here as well that describes the transverse direction from that zero degree so that would be the transverse direction uh, based on the zero degree fiber reference and there's also a blue arrow you can't see it on this image because it's pointing down um, but that direction is for the normal normal to the surface. So this is what surface mapping looks like. You can see how it kind of maps around these kind of curvier regions in here. That might not be the most accurate for how the fiber is actually manufactured. These types of organic materials with lots of curvature, those fibers might be more or less dense 
in these high curvature areas and that that's getting a little bit further into the into the weeds on composite design it's a concept that composite designers call draping um, that's not something that SOLIDWORKS simulation can do because it's not a composite design tool it's the composite module is just inside of SOLIDWORKS simulation so the design piece of it comes directly from your CAD geometry so whether you're doing a surface or solid body um, that might not be able to do all of the composite design that you need. We'll talk a little bit more about this draping concept and more organic shapes. We have a different tool that's on the 3D Experience platform that can handle these these types of more advanced design design situations where you're wanting to take into account this draping that happens in curvature areas. Sometimes because of that surface mapping doesn't work. Those UV curves just aren't accurate. The other option that we have is this planar mapping. So that planar mapping defines the zero degree direction relative to some reference. It could be a plane in your model, it could be an edge or a face, uh, just has to be a planar geometry and that that geometry reference defines our zero degree. All right, so before we get too far into the definition on it, I'm going to jump into actual SOLIDWORKS software rather than just showing you, you pictures there. And we're going to walk through how we define that shell element. So here's that same part I've been showing on the, on the images in those slides. Where we get that shell definition, you see in this case it has a surface body. I can apply these, these shell elements directly to the surface body. If I had a collection of solid faces, I could do it that way as well. It's just this right click on that body in your simulation tree and grab this defined shell by selected faces. But since I have the surface body, I can just go straight into that shell definition. And this is the, this is the button that differenti differentiates you into the composite module. All right, so if you don't have a simulation premium license, you won't have this button. You'll just have the thin or thick option. The composite option comes with simulation premium. And here you see right away when I go into this over in the graphics area, it shows me that preview, that same image I was looking at. And what it's giving me is a preview of the fiber orientation on, my, on this ply that I have selected here. So see as I'm going through ply one, the first layer, it's oriented at a 45 for ply 2 we see it flips because that orientation is set to a minus 45 and see I switch it to a 90 and then it comes back to 0 for it for in the middle and I got a couple zeros and then a 90 minus 45 and a 45 again so it's 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 symmetric here the options that I have for this orientation I could do a sandwich that's just a three layer a three layer sandwich so maybe you've got uh, thin material on the outside and a thicker material in the middle sandwich is perfect for that if you're doing something that's maybe not symmetric or is more than those three plies you can do uh, just plug in however many layers of plies you want right here and you see i've got eight in there and, it, and that fills in down here and lets me start defining each individual ply even got shortcuts here for making it symmetric so you don't have to fill out the the symmetric side you can also make plies all the same material if that's your scenario but down here in this uh, in the where we define our shell plies you see each row each ply each layer has a different thickness a different fiber orientation angle and they can also have a different material in there as well so we, we fill each one of these out, choose whether we want that surface or planar mapping. See, I've got surface mapping on. If I switch it to planar, it asks me for some kind of geometric reference. It could be a face or an edge or a plane here. And see how that just kind of globally applies the same direction to the entire model here, rather than mapping it to the surface itself. It's mapping to that reference instead. I'm not going to be able to show it here on this example because it's all one face right here. It's just a single extruded surface in this case. If I had more than one face, I could change the orientation of the fibers for any combination of faces on the same ply. So maybe on the same layer, you want to have a 45 and a minus 45 on the same layer. This is how you would change that right here. Just choose 
choose the face and then you can either mirror the orientation or rotate it. So that's either flipping it or uh, adjusting it by 90 degrees basically is what that's doing. All right, so that's the shell definition. I'm gonna jump out of that and back into my slides. So over here on the slides, I just highlighted the the controls for how, where do we have controls for orienting the fiber? So we can do this rotate zero reference. That's basically just flipping the the X and the Y direction. People in the industry will call that direction one and direction two. So that's just switching the the fiber orientation direction and the transverse direction. Just flipping those back and forth is what that checkbox does for rotating the zero reference. We saw here on this table that angle changes the, the orientation of the fiber for that particular layer and it shows you that in the preview as well in the graphics area. You can type out that number for each one of these rows or you can use the slider if you like that. And then I mentioned this is how you, you change the orientation on just a single face rather than the entire layer. That composite orientation here. For formulating our stack up, I talked about that three layer sandwich option, or we can do a multi-layer laminate where we choose a total number of plies here. We define the thickness. So again, a, another thing, I didn't mention this, but this thickness determines how high, how tall, how thick uh, the composite is going to be around that surface body, that surface geometry that we choose. All right, so how, how thick is that gonna be? We define that on a per layer basis. All right, so now getting into material definition. So I mentioned we do that material definition on each ply. Each ply could be a different material if you really wanted it to. There's no requirement there in this, this example that I'm showing. I just have them all the same material. It's a nice shortcut right here, so you don't have to fill in each row. If you want to change it for any individual row, we've got this familiar material symbol that we can click on to go into our material database and start setting that up. I'm going to jump back into SolidWorks here to show that. Here on this Select Material button, see that pulls up the material database. Nothing special here. Um, as far as the database goes, other than the fact that most of the time these materials are going to be custom for our composite materials. And the reason for that is because it's such a, a complex material behavior that we usually like to define that in a custom material so that we can we can have it customized for ourselves. The out-of-the-box materials that come with the SolidWorks installation aren't going to have all the properties you need. So we go into a custom material and most of the time as well I mentioned that orthotropic word. So jumping between isotropic you see you just have one elastic modulus it assumes that it's a uniform material something like a steel or aluminum is a good example of an isotropic material but for orthotropic see we have different we have different numbers in different directions so I've been talking about this X direction as gonna it's gonna be stiffer because the fibers are oriented that way we reflect that in the material properties here so the X direction in the material database corresponds to the ply direction, the, the orientation of the fibers, the y direction is going to be transverse to the fibers, and the z is the, the material property normal to the surface. All right, so that, that's how we read those numbers. And also these are input as, as bulk fields. Bulk fields meaning that, like I talked about at the very beginning, we Usually a composite is at least two materials, usually it's two. So how do we describe the, you know, maybe we have glass fibers and a thermal set resin, resin, for example. Both of those materials have very different properties. So we input them into SolidWorks, we have to kind of combine them together to input into, into SolidWorks and input them as a bulk material field. How do, we, how do we figure out the correct number there? Because we kind of have to estimate that. 
Um, a lot of times, ideally, you would get that from your manufacturer or your supplier, maybe on a data sheet or maybe through some of your own physical testing. But in the event that you don't have those numbers and you just have, say, the, the resin and the glass material properties on their own, you need to combine them together to get that bulk property field. And the way that you do that is using the rule of mixtures. You get to do some fun math on that. So I just saved this as a slide so we can jump back and look at those material properties easily if we need to. And here is that rule of mixtures. So in this rule of mixtures, it kind of just estimates your composite stiffness, combines those fiber and matrix properties together. And it basically, if we look at the if the, in the fiber direction, we can see we're, we're taking the Young's modulus for the composite overall, and we get that by multiplying the volume fraction of fibers or the volume fraction of the matrix against their, uh, their individual Young's modulus, and that gives you the combined Young's modulus. So pretty easy to fill that out into like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, that kind of thing to get these numbers very quickly and easily. You just punch in your numbers and it'll spit the, the combined numbers out. So we have properties for the fiber direction and in the transverse direction. They, 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 mixed to, they mix together differently. So that's how you define the materials. And yes, I, I already define these myself by me. So in, your, in real applications, you'll have to probably do this rule of mixtures yourself. Uh, the numbers that I put in there, I'd already run these calculations myself just to save on time. Ultimately, what we're doing with simulation, we're trying to predict how, how it might fail, see if it will fail. So in, in SolidWorks Composites, we, re we plot our results on individual applies. Uh, there are failure criteria that we use to determine to determine failure, we have, they're, they're pretty popular, pretty commonly used across the industry. We can look at a single mode failure criteria. Uh, what that single mode means is it's looking at the maximum stress in any one of the pr principal material coordinates. If, it, if that number on its own is greater than that respective strength that we put in in the material properties, it'll call that a failure. So it's just a single mode, say maybe we have um, tension on the matrix, maybe. We would go in and look at our um, tensile modulus in the y direction to see if the if the matrix is going to be failing in tension, just as a, as a simple example there. So just a single mode, it's tension on the matrix, maybe it's tension on the fibers, um, but just looking at a single mode. We also have those interactive failure criteria. What those do, they consider interaction between the different components of stress in that formulation. So instead of a non-interactive stress-based criterion like we have with that maximum stress criteria, the Tsai Hill and Tsai Wu failure criteria will kind of consider how the different stress components are going to interact with each other. So it'll take into account better if you have like a combination situation where maybe there's shear and tension at the same time and kind of add them together and take them into account. So that Psi Hill, just kind of as a note, that's for if the materials, the material that you're using, the composite material is comparable strength and tension and compression, where the Psi Wu is if they're, they're wildly different in tension and compression. So different fibers, different matrix, matrix materials will have different properties. So just keep in mind that those those two interactive failure criteria have different applications depending on the loading situation. Just quickly visualizing here how we how we might predict results and we, we can break down the stress components into each one of these components that I'm showing here just to, just, just to kind of give a visual here of well when the matrix is compressing it's gonna it's gonna fail about the same way as it would with if it, if it was in tension and shear along that Z on the YZ plane so tension and compression on the matrix if we're if we're looking at the YZ plane now, if we look at the XY plane, this is kind of along the fiber direction. That's what the, these lines are trying to show here is the fiber direction. So we can shear the matrix. We can put the, 
the the fibers into tension themselves, and we can even compress them too, where they kind of kind of buckle and wrinkle into each other as well. We can break down and look at each one of these stress components, and that's where we can compare that against maybe our our tensile stress in the x direction right here would would allow us to compare that against fiber compression. So uh, kind of lets you almost predict what the failure mode is going to be depending on what kind of stress you're seeing in the model. We also have, so those on the previous slide here, these, these are all intralaminar failure modes. So happening within the layer itself, um, not interacting with any of the other layers. We also have interlaminar, so failure between layers, failure between plies. SolidWorks simulation can predict these on the shear side. They can predict if it's if it's getting close to a sliding shear or a scissoring shear situation. We have interlaminar shear stress we can look at and compare that against our our uh, shear modulus and our shear strength, but we can't predict the tension if, if the plies are going to kind of peel apart like that. Um, it's just advanced material behavior that we can't model, um, but we can we can predict at least the shear by looking at the shear stress. The geometry isn't actually going to show this, but you can at least see the shear stress on those. Just to quickly jump into some of those results, so I can I can show you how it how it looks inside a solid work. for the stress plots. You see here it's modeled on an individual ply. So going into the definition of that plot, see we choose a ply that we're going to look at specifically and we can even narrow it down to the top face or the bottom face of that ply. So either side of that thickness we put in for that ply layer. Or you can kind of do an envelope plot right here with this checkbox. You can look at a maximum across all of the plies. Here are all the different stress components. So yeah, thinking about this, the X normal, keeping this checkbox on to display the results in the composite surfaces. This is showing us the stress in the fiber direction. So we know we're pretty stiff in that direction and this this 269 that that doesn't that doesn't worry me too much because if I remember right it was over 2000 was our uh, strength in that direction. So we're super stiff in that X direction. We're not too worried about that. But see if we jump down to say maybe the Y normal stress Here's how that looks. The numbers are much lower, but our stiffness in those in those orientations in that Y direction is much lower. So we need to be a little bit more concerned about this, this 26. Because looking at our material again, coming back into that, looking at our, I'm going to change the units here. Our tensile strength in the Y direction is only 57 megapascals for tensile. And it's a little bit tougher in the compressive. It goes up to 228, but still, those 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 numbers are pretty low in the y direction. That's kind of one of the downsides: is that you're you're super stri stiff in one direction, but not so much in the other direction. So, um, high stresses in that y direction or the z direction can can become problems quickly. So that's how we look at stress. And if we want to go and do a factor of safety plot, that's how we look at one of those failure criteria. So in this case. It makes sense for us to be in the Psi Hill because the uh, they have equal strengths in tension and compression. And yeah, we're also primarily in tension on this. We're just pushing down on these holes in the middle and we're, f oops, flipped it around. And we're, we're fixed on these holes. So we're primarily in tension. I'm gonna set my limit for factor of safety. It's gonna be 10. It's just not gonna show any numbers higher than 10. I'm gonna look at a worst case factor of safety using that that failure criteria across all of my plies. Let me show that plot here. It takes a second to pull that data because I have eight layers and it's doing top and bottom on all of those. And yeah, it just takes a minute to pull that data because it's pulling a lot of numbers and determining, okay, at every single node, what is the worst case? So we see here on the low end, if say maybe we wanna check for a factor of safety of two, anything that's black here is below a factor of safety of two. Remember, I did this as a worst case across all plies. So how do we figure out which ply is getting below that factor of safety of two? Maybe that's the criteria we want to be at least above a factor of safety of two. I can go into the probe tool here, and that will show me 
once it loads again that's a lot of data to pull for every single node but yeah maybe just following along this edge we can see ply number one is where that factor of safety of 1.7 was calculated so I'm just gonna grab a few points around here and see yeah these are all on ply one in this area even come out here so that's telling us that ply one is the is the offender uh, for being below that factor of safety of two so maybe that's an indication for us that maybe we need to make that ply a little thicker or maybe we need to try a different fiber orientation that kind of thing we can also look at our stress and see which uh, which stress component is going to be most contributing to that factor of safety remember that's an interactive failure criteria it's kind of taking into account multiple stress components so we saw that the X yeah the Y is definitely following that same profile of factor of safety let's look at the Z normal that's the direction normal to the the surface itself so we're kind of even that's following that profile we saw in the factor of safety too so we can kind of conclude from that that the Y normal and the Z normal are contributing to that factor of safety so we know that we're good in the fiber direction but the Y and Z starting to become a little bit of a problem maybe we need to play around with a different fiber orientation for that first ply to help us get some some stiffness uh, up in this area That's just kind of a quick primer on how we, how we look at things. I do also kind of at the end here, just want to mention the options that we have available on the 3D experience platform. There are a lot of benefits to using that tool. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I want to at least introduce it because it's something that we at Go Engineer are starting to become a lot more familiar with um, as these, these tools are being introduced to us on the, on the, on the platform. And these tools are trickling down from uh, the CATIA and Simulia environments from Dassault Systems. And really what the, the, tool, the composites tool in 3D Experience, what the differentiators are be between what I've shown and that software is it's an all-in-one environment for composite design and simulation in the same environment. So you, we saw in, in SolidWorks simulation, we're, we're defining the stack up and the orientation and the thickness all in the simulation not in the design tool so that's one of the big differences you you do all of your stack up information in the design tool setting all of your fibers and doing more advanced stuff than we're able to do in SolidWorks you're able to do non-uniform layups you can do non-planar ply is a lot better and we have that draping in there as well so that integrated workflow is super super powerful it's really robust can do a lot of things that SOLIDWORKS simulation just can't for advanced situations just going through a few screenshots here yeah on this one right here you can see also that uh, it's using hex elements so those of you who know um, hex elements usually map better to non uh, non planar geometry so again just another uh, checkbox on it works better with more advanced geometry we can see we've got a different visibility here for the fiber orientations there are kind of a, a stacked up plot uh, with a section view through each ply here's a, a non-uniform layup you can see some of those plies are only covering a portion of the model rather than like we saw in SOLIDWORKS it applies it to the entire geometry so you, that's that's a differentiator there for this this 3d experience tool and then yeah so we're seeing yeah the non-planar here so this is the fiber orientation the same red green blue that we have for fiber transverse and normal those are you can see the normal is changing throughout the face and SOLIDWORKS doesn't do that it keeps the same normal across the entire face so it handles those non-planar situations a lot better and then lastly we have draping this is a really big thing and what we're seeing here is we're changing the seed is what that's called and we're seeing how that affects fiber orientation so what's showing there is it is what 
the red means that it's too thin in that area. So we need to move that rosette to a different spot to make sure that there's enough thickness through that curvature. So really advanced fiber orientation tools, really advanced uh, design capabilities for composites. And also the simulation does all the same stuff that I, that I showed plus more. Um, there are different loading cases and things like that that can use composites on this 3D experience platform. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this recorded webinar, please subscribe and leave us a comment below if you have a topic you'd like us to cover in a future video. Visit our website for access to professional training, upcoming events, and more from your number one online technical resource. See you next time.